lakes. But the most touching pictures were of Tim Daggett withdrawing halfway through the competition. The teary-eyed Daggett, who had bravely endured great pain in his leg for the last 10 months in the hopes of going to Seoul, would later leave the floor to a standing ovation. And with the Olympics seemingly well within Dan Hayden's grasp, the 1988 national champion, bothered by a separated shoulder, had a slip away as he fell from third to eighth on his final apparatus. And here are the six members of the 1988 U.S. Men's Olympic Gymnastics team. The tension and the emotion continues today with the final chapter of the Women's Gymnastics Trials. They represent what appear to be the most innocent of dreams, but this innocence can be broken as easily as a fragile teenage heart. For the reminders are very clear of just how cruel and judgmental the world is for someone like Christy Phillips. Someone she may or may not ever be able to be. At 14, she was a star. But then her body began to change. And at age 16, she is attempting a comeback. The judges have little sympathy if you don't look the part. But not every story is as severe. Some have a happy ending. But everyone involves a special little person, surviving in an atmosphere set by adults, maybe coaches that can't agree, administrators who are blind to their needs. Today, America's top gymnast, Phoebe Mills, only needs to be as good as she has been this week. While Christy Phillips needs to cap her comeback with the best day of her life. Melissa Marlowe will hear the cheers because we're in Salt Lake City, and this is her home. Their childhood may be lost forever, but they wouldn't have it any other way. Just maybe, they can go where Olga, Nadia, and Mary Lou have been. And today it will be decided who will represent the United States of America at the Summer Olympics as Coca-Cola presents the Olympic trials in the sport of women's gymnastics. bring you the constant variety of sport. And they're off. He's going to run the first four minute mile. I'm always confident I'll whip all of them. The thrill of victory. Pelé has scored in his last half for the Cosmos. The biggest upset in the history of Little League. And the agony of defeat. And look, at him, look at him go. Oh, baby. Yarborough right out of the racetrack. The human drama of athletic competition. World record number 72. Leonard. In our 28th year, this is ABC's Wide World of Sports. We are live in Salt Lake City, Utah. We've been following their careers now for the better part of four years, and this is their day, as Coca-Cola presents the Women's Gymnastics U.S. Olympic Trials. Good afternoon, I'm Al Troutwig, along with Kathy Rigby-McCoy, and we'll be following many stories today, as only six will get the chance to go to Seoul. And it will be difficult, really, for us to empathize with these young women, won't it be? Well, I think that only these gymnasts will know the sacrifices that they have made to get here, and only these gymnasts will know the joy or the pain at the end of today's competition. We'll get the complicated part out of the way first, for the scoring that is to go on here to determine those final six is rather complicated. It is a two-stage affair. The first was the U.S. Nationals in Houston. There were compulsories and optionals there, which count in total towards 40% of the score. And then 60% here at Salt Lake City at the trials. We've already had the compulsories, and today the final 24%, the optionals, which will determine the final 100% of the score. After the compulsories, which were held two days ago, Phoebe Mills, who is now the nation's top gymnast, has a very comfortable lead over Kelly, Garris, and Steves from the University of Oklahoma, who at the age of 21 is a married woman and may be on the verge of representing the United States Olympic team. Hope Spivey from the Parquettes in Pennsylvania, Randy Johnson, Shelley Stack, also a Caroli teammate, Melissa Marlowe, and then Do Yamashiro, who came into the, this trailing uh, Marlowe by just a little bit and representing a, a, an effort so close until this morning when she uh, hurt her ankle and had to withdraw from the competition. And that gave the opening to Christy Phillips. Phillips, uh, another gymnast who was eighth after the first rotation into the second rotation, needing 
a good effort to move up and take advantage of what Dolia Mashiro's withdrawal from the competition had done. Now she had a fair performance on the uneven parallel bar. She really needs to make up some points here on the vault. This isn't one of her best events, but she's a real fighter. And the man who is involved in some controversy we'll be getting into, a man who has the highest profile in gymnastics, Bella Caroli. And she coach. will attempt a full twisting Yurchenko, round off vault. You don't get much better than that. As I said, she is a fighter. She should be no, pleased with that vault. That's going to be good. More flat, isn't it? Try to go more a little bit. Okay, a little bit was flat. Move it harder. She's very aggressive on the run. Just what she needs. The position on the horse, I mean on the board, is perfect. Good position in the air. Look how tight her legs are. And she lands it solidly. We have two routines going on at the same time. You heard the crowd reacting to the dramatic finish of the routine of Melissa Marlowe on the uneven bars. As we've already told you, this is her hometown, and she's been on the front page of the newspaper for five or six days now, and she's a big favorite. And right now, she's in the sixth and final position to make the team. This was her performance moments ago. She does have the crowd behind her, which sometimes can be difficult because you feel the added pressure. But she is performing extremely well. She did perform well. Perfect position on that handstand. Just moments ago, the 87 Pan American Games gold medalist in this event. These gymnasts are really gripping the bar today, although she's moving so freely, just what the judges were looking for. And we're waiting for Melissa Marlowe's score to be posted, and I can tell you that Christy Phillips' score on the first vault was a 9.863, as she prepares to now vault again. You get two attempts, this was moments ago. You get two attempts in the vault here in the women's competition. It's like a two-ring circus here watching every event at once. Good position in the air. Little hop there. She won't get quite as good a score. The cheers again as we look at Christy Phillips are for Marlowe's score of 9.913. She's not ready to give up that sixth and final place. Not yet. Her coach there at Rocky Mountain Gymnastics is... Mark Lee. Melissa Marlowe's parents divorced, her father sitting at one end of the arena, her mother at the other end, and I'm sure if they could look across, they'd be smiling at each other now. Some happiness for the Marlowe family. From her company. We are back live in Salt Lake City, Utah, the U.S. Olympic Trials in Women's Gymnastics. Phoebe Mills leading the way, Kelly Garrison, Steves, Hope Spivey, Brandy Johnson, Shelly Stack in the sixth and final position, right now held by Melissa Marlowe. Now, Rhonda Fain, another member of the Caroli Gymnastics team, slid in front of her teammate, Christy Phillips, in the first rotation. She was seventh, and that's a critical spot. You still get a chance to go to Seoul if you're seventh as an alternate. She's really proven in the past to be a consistent, stable performer. She proved herself at the World Championships in Rotterdam by being the number one American gymnast. This was her second rotation vault moments ago. She is one of the top vaulters in the competition. Here we go for her first vault. Good block off the horse. Great vault. One of the things Bella Caroli stresses with his athletes is having those stable, secure landings that almost drop in. Okay. Drop that. I'd like to apologize. We're on some backup audio lines on ABC's Wide World of Sports today. We're working to fix that, of course. Now, a 9.75 for Rhonda Fain will keep her in front of Christy Phillips. We're waiting for her score. Here's what it looked like. What he was talking to her about is blocking. She blocks her shoulders into the horse, gets tremendous height and distance, and she just drops in that landing. And there are tens across the board for Rhonda Fain. And you can see why. It's really difficult. She's very tall, five foot five, but she really gets that block. She moves that body around so easily. And she does it again. Possibly two tens here. 
He scored a perfect 10 in the vault at the USA Championship, which were the opening stage to the decisions to how the six would be decided to go to Seoul. That was in Houston. She looks so comfortable doing this vault. She's not labored at all. Good position in the air. They could take off maybe a half attempt for that those uh, leg separation. Ronda only needed a 9.75 to stay in front of Christy Phillips with a perfect 10. That is really going to put pressure on Christy Phillips. It makes her mission all the more difficult. Now you recognize that uniform there, the white with the purple and the blue. That's the uniform of Caroli's Gymnastics. And it may look as though all the gymnasts here are wearing that uniform, and so many of them are. Now, just moments ago, Shelly Sack, another one of Ronda Fain's teammates, gave a performance that we're going to watch now on the uneven bar. She was in fifth position after the first rotation. And this routine was so clean, so precise. Her hand stands right above the bar. Look how high on that. Reverse tack. No form break. She says she doesn't get nervous in competition because she's just a confident gymnast. Obviously here. Perfect position in the air. Watch this dismount. Very nice routine. That was moments ago. This is now live. Shelly Stack. Little from Birmingham, Alabama. Spending all her time now, though, in Houston. Whatever life she had in Birmingham is history, at least for now. And her score was a 9.925. So the smiles were for real. And that should uh, help keep her standing firm in fifth position. Bella says that she is a showgirl reminiscent of Mary Lou. So the pressure continues to mount on Christy Phillips. Phillips needs the day of her life. Hers is an interesting story, there is no doubt about it. Pressures that no teenager should have to face. Frank Gifford takes a closer look at her story. From 1986 through the first half of 1987, Christy Phillips was America's gymnastics sweetheart. Twice a national champion, Christy had the same talent style that made comparisons to Mary Lou Retton inevitable. But between her coronation as a new Mary Lou and these Olympic trials, something changed, mainly her body. Christy Phillips grew up, added almost four inches and 20 pounds. The moves that took her to the top no longer came so easy. The first time was when she took second place in the all-around competition at last summer's Pan American Games. Then in October's World Championships, her compulsory performance was so dismal, she failed to make the top 36 of the all-around. The star was flaring out. I was kind of getting down on myself. I wasn't really going into the gym and working as hard as I could every day because I, you know, I, was, I just kind of felt, you know, kind of slacking off. I wasn't giving it all I got. And so I needed to change my motivational habits. That change took place January. She left Caroli's gym to train in Southern California with U.S. Olympic coach Don Peters. Christy had been used to 40-hour, six-day weeks with the keen competition of Caroli's gym in Houston. Peters' schedule was about half that. Christy put on weight, suffered a string of nagging injuries, lost her competitive edge. All the way up again. All the way. All the way. I got to change my motivation, but then I started losing hours, you know, in the gym. There we went five to six hours a day, four days a week. And it was a major difference, and I could really feel it catching up with me. And so I really needed to come back and start working all those hours again um, so I could be better. In May, just two months before the trials, Christy returned to Houston to train with Bella Caroli. Don Peters, the coach of the Olympic team, would not comment on the change. But Bella Caroli offers his observation. Get it up all the way handstand. But when she came back, uh, that was <laughs> that was shocking, shocking to me. Overweight, out of shape, dragging herself around the floor. Only one thing was the same: her dedication and desire. I've been working hard. I've gone through a lot, and I really feel that it, all my hard work and dedication is going to pay off. And I feel I'm going to be there. And I feel I'm going to make it. And I don't want to think about the other side. She lost all the weight on a diet of tuna, boiled eggs, and water. That most definitely is food for thought if you're thinking that your daughter should be doing something like this. We'll be back. We continue with the Women's Gymnastics Olympic Trials. Here are the standings. Remember as you look at them that the top six will represent the United States in Seoul in September. 
It is really a battle between eight women of the 18 who are competing for those six spots. Melissa Marlowe trying to hold off Rhonda Fain and Christy Phillips, two more members of the Caroli Gymnastics Group from Houston. Now, Don Peters, who will be the Olympic coach, has suffered many a disappointment in battling Bella Caroli for the coaching position, and we'll talk more about that later. But even more disappointing for him was the loss of two of his well-established gymnasts, Sabrina Marr, who uh, dropped out after the compulsories, and then just before the competition today, Do Yamashiro, whose sprained ankle just proved to be too much for her. And right now, Becky Dixon is there to talk to both of them. Becky? Thank you, Al. Sabrina, you and Doe have both experienced a great deal of pain during your careers, but today the real pain has to be in your heart. What are you saying to yourself to try to erase some of that pain? Mostly that we've got the fond memories to hang on to, um, our past achievements, Pan American Games, World Championships, and Goodwill Games, and that we just mainly tried our hardest and just didn't pull through. Doe, both of you have been with Coach John Peters for a number of years. You were his top two gymnasts coming into this competition. Now you're both out of it, and you won't accompany him to Seoul with the Olympic team. In any way, do you feel like you've let him down? I can't say we've let him down. We gave it our best shot. We were a little disappointed with our bodies, and they didn't hold up, but we gave it our best, and he knows we did. He believes in us. A big disappointment that you won't be going to Seoul, but both of you have some pretty big plans for the fall. Sabrina, you'll be going to UCLA and Doe Stanford, and we want to wish both of you the best of luck in the future. Thank you. Al. All right, Becky, and only yards from them sits Dan Hayden with a cast on his arm. He's not going to Seoul either. Let's go up to Frank Gifford. Thank you very much, Al. And staying on top of things as we approach Seoul, as many of you know by now, diver Bruce Kimball, the silver medalist in the 1984 Olympics in Los Angeles, was arrested earlier in the week on charges of vehicular homicide. Kimball allegedly drove his car into a group of teenagers in Brandon, Florida, killing two and injuring six others. Law enforcement officials are still investigating and have not filed formal charges against Kimball. The results of a blood alcohol test to determine whether Kimball was legally drunk have not been released. Kimball's father, who coaches Bruce, and his counsel have both recommended that he still take part in the Olympic diving trials in two weeks. Well, Tim Daggett is joining me now, and last night we all suffered as we watched him try to make a comeback from that horrible injury of last October the broken leg, the severed artery, and no one believed, first of all, him, you would ever be here last night. But again, we all suffered with every move you made. And when did you know you really could not carry on? Well, you know, it wasn't good right from the start, Frank. Uh, I woke up in the morning and my leg was, was really sore. It just, uh, it didn't seem to respond the way it had in the past. Uh, the more pounding that I put on it, it, uh, it just wasn't recuperating. And right from the start, it was... Uh, it was a little scary. Tim, last night you cheerfully said that was the end, the career was over. Uh, you've had a night to sleep on that. Uh, any second thoughts? Well, you know, at this point, uh, I really have to take some time. You know, uh, it was my dream to get to this meet. And, uh, you know, everybody told me that it really probably wasn't possible. But uh, it was something that I had to do. It's something that I said to myself. And I had to try. And last night when we decided that I wasn't going to continue, you know, I had a meeting with my coach and my trainer and my doctor, and uh, we decided at that point we had really won. And uh, it was okay to stop at that point. When you left the arena last night, it had to be one of the most moving moments in your life, even though one of the saddest, when all of your teammates, all of your associates, all the gymnasts, an unannounced withdrawal to this arena, and they broke into tremendous applause. Everyone congratulating you, shaking your hand. It must have been a very moving moment for you, Tim. Yeah, very much so. You know, you're, to get acceptance from your peers like that and your fans, I mean, it's, uh, it, it's a great feeling. There, there's so many great individuals out there, and they've dedicated their lives and uh, everything that they have inside of them to being the best they can be and to, to you know, to get their thanks and their appreciation. It, it, it helped me a lot. Really Tim, we would like to see you go to Seoul, perhaps as an honorary captain, maybe working for the competition, whatever. <laughs> We've enjoyed following your career, Tim. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Frank. It was a great effort, and it was a triumph, no matter what happened. Right now, we're going back to Al Trotman. Yeah, Frank, last night they were passing around a lot of tissues here at the Salt Palace for Dan Hayden. He was in third place going into the last event, then suddenly a high bar routine, which he has performed literally hundreds of times, failed him as he could not overcome the pain of a separated shoulder from the routine before. A sad story in Salt Lake City, but we've got some joy to come. Here's the man who was 
the coach of Sabrina Marr and Do Yamashiro and will be the coach of the U.S. Olympic team in Seoul in September. The embattled coach of this team, Don Peters, and we'll have more on his story later as we prepare for the last two rotations in our live coverage on ABC's Wide World of Sports today. The next apparatus we will focus on is the balance beam. And Kathy Rigby McCoy gives us a little bit more focus as to what that will mean. The overall execution on the balance beam should give the impression that the gymnast is performing on a floor 40 feet wide, not a strip of wood four inches narrow. The gymnast is required in 70 to 90 seconds to perform a routine that varies in rhythm and has a full range of dance techniques. The gymnast has to cover the entire beam and perform at least one acrobatic series consisting of tumbling with flight. All this makes the balance beam the most precarious and breathtaking of the women's events. And this will be the stage for the next performer we will watch, Kelly Garrison-Steves, who right now, after two rotations, is in second place. Maybe the most unique story here, Kelly's 21 years old, a senior at Oklahoma, where she lives with her husband, Mark, who was also a gymnast there. She began in gymnastics in 1974, a year after Shelley Stack and Brandy Johnson were born. Very risky opening, round off, back tuck onto the beam, and she did it so securely. Kelly's routine has evolved since 1979. However, it's totally different today. But you take it piece by piece and you improve it a little at a time. Meanwhile, Brandy Johnson has begun her performance on the floor exercise. We'll check in with that complete routine a little bit later as we continue our live coverage with Kelly Garrison Steves. That's a very unusual movement named after Kelly. It's a Valdez almost in a horizontal position. There's her required full turn. Very difficult move to do, especially under this kind of pressure. Kelly doesn't seem to be holding back. Kathy, she works out with the Oklahoma weight coach and is the only woman allowed to use the weight room when the football team is in there. I don't know how she got permission from Barry Switzer to do that, but she did. Is that something you would recommend for a gymnast, weight training? Well, I never had the opportunity to work with weights, but it's made a big improvement in, in Kelly's um, gymnastics, her endurance and her strength. But she's also used it to make her body look a little bit more like the younger gymnast. That, that is what her coach Becky Buick was telling me. Here's her dismount, round off, double tuck. Very good routine. There's Becky. Watching quietly, wondering just how many of his gymnasts will make this Olympic team is Bella Caroli. He parades around the arena. He is really a media darling, and that's one of the good reasons job. that... All right. Good job. Don Peters has such a difficult time battling his publicity. He is also a big horoscope fan, and we checked his stars just to see what Virgo uh, has in store for him today. Well, you get acceptance when you back up what you say and do. Schedules are subject to far-reaching changes, and you can make money through partnership. Well, the last one is, uh, is just a given, and we'll talk about the other two in a minute. Phoebe Mills is a Scorpio, as was Nadia, and that's a big factor for uh, Bella. Then Shelly Stack, Christy Phillips, Rhonda Fain, and Brandy Johnson. And you can see that just about all their horoscopes apply to today. But, you know, my horoscope always applies to today, too. They always seem to do that. Anyway, Bella has said he is not going to go to Seoul. And you remember the second part of his horoscope, that his schedule may change? Well, he may wind up going. Who knows? And the first one was, you can back up what you say and do. Well, he says he knows how to push the right buttons for the right gymnasts at the right time. And he has certainly prepared Phoebe Mills at the right time. At one point, it was thought that Bella would give the United States its top gymnast in the name of Christy Phillips. Well, as she continues her comeback, he has given the United States its top gymnast, but her name is Phoebe Mills. You would think, looking at her, that she's feeling a great deal of pressure, even though she's standing way on top. Her style is reminiscent of Nadia, rather unemotional. Her technique is polished, she's confident, but she's not cocky. She knows what she has to do. I was talking to Marta Caroli and she said one of the reasons her gymnasts have been so successful on the uneven bars and balance beam especially is because they do many, many repetitions, probably more than a lot of the other gymnasts in practice. She was the all-around champion of the U.S. Nationals. 
and in first place right now. Dan Hayden was the champion on the men's side in the all around at the U.S. Nationals and had a horrible fate. She does have a great sense of humor. She performs to the music of the Adams family. And the ever popular full in double back in a pike position. You can see why she's the best. They replay Adam's family reruns in Seoul. You can really see Phoebe's personality coming out here. And believe me, in Seoul, that will be very important. You want to capture not only the judge's attention, but the audience. Here's your required second tumbling run, whip over. Beautiful double pike. and those legs, this double back ending will be no problem. Morticia and Gomez would be proud. <laughs> so is Bella. That is a solid one. That's how you're supposed to be. He's tough to please. That's how you're supposed to be. <laughs> Kelly Garrison, Steve's score on the beam was a 9-7-8-8. We'll check on Phoebe Mills' tally in a moment. We'll be back as Coca-Cola presents the U.S. Olympic Trials and Women's Gymnastics after this message and a word from our local stations. is only five foot tall but growing taller with each and every routine her confidence is just making phoebe mills so strong and so impressive to watch her score on the floor exercise with a 9.963 she maintains her first place standing here at the olympic trials with scores of 9935 99 and a 9963 we're getting ready to watch christy phillips on the balance beam and uh, as she prepares to mount the beam we want to show you what uh, bella said to her before this trial Oh, Nadia, we know she had to go through the same thing. You, she gained a lot of weight before the World Championships, and, you know, it was hard, but we, we motivate her. We, we get her up because you, you're going to do it. You're going you're gonna to make it if you work hard. <laughs> I don't know if Bella knows that she does, Bella, but Christy Phillips may be one of the best beam performers in the world. Unfortunately, she finished second at the Pan Am Games in Indianapolis in 87 after falling off the beam, receiving only a 9.35, and that was as Phoebe's career was at a very down point. If she makes the team, she has a real good chance on this apparatus of winning a medal. She has some unusual talents. She's extremely flexible, as you will see in her mount. It's Eighth. called the Philip Planche. Eighth place after the second rotation, trailing Rhonda Fain and Missy Marlowe by a very large margin, with only one more routine to go after this. With all the pressure, she seems to work with confidence. And it's a very difficult routine, though. Oops, slight break there. Possibly a tenth or two. The crowd is reacting to other activities in the arena. Two apparatus being performed on at the same time. And yet you're so focused, you don't even hear them. And that noise is for the hometown girl, Missy Marlowe. And we'll let you know how she did on floor exercise shortly. Meanwhile, Christy Phillips wrapping up the beam. Watch this. Once again, showing her flexibility. This is her reverse planche split. She's really moving quite well, even though the pressure is so intense here. Side flip. Can't let up here, but this is her dismount. Round off that handspring, double 
hike. Good landing. She's hanging in there. taken on this apparatus and you can do just how narrow that four inches is for some of these movements you're flipping in the air you're trying to maintain your balance during that and you can see she was just off slightly only a hair and yet that can cause a bobble you can sense the atmosphere of anticipation growing with each and every moment here at the salt palace as this trials comes down near the dramatic finish and the concentration on this dismount really shows, and she just lands this without any steps, a little bit low with the shoulders, but I don't think the judges will take off for that. So many people were ready to write Christy off when she gained some weight because of her mother, quite frankly. Her mother is a very large woman who, when she was in high school, was a football player, nowhere near a gymnast, and she doesn't have the body type that would lead one to believe that there could be a gymnast in this family. But Christy is shown to be someone of strong fortitude someone who is willing to take all the criticism and come back Melissa Marlowe just finishing the floor exercise and a score was 9.825 and that should keep her in sixth place this was the floor exercise and Kathy we know while we were watching Christy the crowd was reacting to some very special stuff well she is a gorgeous dancer but interestingly enough has never taken a ballet class very unusual for a top-rate gymnast. She begins her routine, or began her routine, with a full and double back. Christy Phillips' score was a 9.825. Meanwhile, the crowd in the background is booing for the score that Melissa Marlowe received for the routine that you are watching now. And I'll let you watch the routine and judge for yourself. So expressive. This is her second tumbling run. Remember, they have to do three. You see, she was happy about that. She has all the difficulty required, but there are gymnasts that end with a little more difficulty than she does, and that's probably why she got the 9.8 score. Her last tumbling run was a double tuck. You can see she's, she paused there for the endurance. Take a little breath. She was thrilled, and the biased crowd was too. Then the judges put up a 9.75, and there was a moment of disappointment. But I should say that the judges have been very stringent in their awards, and there have only been two perfect tens so far. There is only one more rotation to come after this, which is not concluded yet. Today, the Olympic team in women's gymnastics will be decided. I thought you got a special guest. Thank you for once again at the Salt Palace in Salt Lake. We'll have more of the Olympic trials in a moment, but a few moments ago, up in Ottawa, Canada, where the Canadian Olympic trials are taking place, Ben Johnson went for a final race in the men's 100 meters. The world record holder at 9.83. Who last night made his first start of this competition since a torn hamstring back in May. He's in lane three. Good start. Always the explosive start of Ben Johnson. Ben Johnson letting up just a little bit with a 9.90. That is seven one hundredths of a second off his world record, but that is still, at this moment, unofficial. So Ben Johnson looks to be in great shape, and he is going to meet Carl Lewis on August the 17th in Zurich, and you will see that race on Wide World of Sports along with the men's gymnastics trials on August the 20th. All right, let's go back to Al Trotwick. All right, Frank, it's so easy as we watch the gymnasts to see the, the joy on their face or the disappointment on their face, but there are some very serious things which are not very easy to see. Donna Deverona has been with us throughout the trials trying to put some important aspects of the competition in perspective, and she'll join Kathy Rigby-McCoy right now to do just that. Kathy? Well, there are an awful lot of talk in gymnastics concerning weight, being in control, and when any of these are out of balance, not only is your career in jeopardy, but 
but also your physical and mental well-being. You have a perfect body for gymnastics. I had to look like the Europeans. I had to do gymnastics like the Europeans, uh, even to the point where I would develop an eating disorder to do it. From 1979 through 1982, Lucy Collins was one of the very best gymnasts in the country. A four-time member of the U.S. national team and a member of the 1980 Olympic squad. But Lucy was also one of an almost epidemic number of female gymnasts who fell victim to the pressures of competition on the elite level. Lucy was bulimic, one who suffers from an eating disorder which involves recurrent episodes of binging on large quantities of food, usually two to three times normal amounts, followed by purging, self-induced vomiting, or the use of laxatives or diuretics in order to prevent weight gain. For sufferers of bulimia, the cost of staying thin are high. Repeated bulimic episodes can result in severe depression, the disruption of menstruation, intestinal bleeding, tooth decay, and even heart attacks. When I get into workouts, I used to be a strong gymnast, and everything's got to be so hard for me. Because you were weak? Because, because I was weak, because I had no protein in my body, and I guess, you know, my body was eating itself. Estimates vary greatly, but some experts believe that as many as one out of every five young women in America has experimented or will experiment with some form of bulimic behavior. No one knows for sure, though, because so much of the disease involves secrecy and denial. Most begin as young high school or college age girls, experiencing difficulties coping with the pressures of growing up, struggling to achieve perfection, and of living in a world in which women are presented and asked to present themselves as objects to be judged by their appearance. For a young gymnast, these pressures are exacerbated by competitions in which their appearances are judged down to the one hundredth of a point, and where the natural process of growing up can mean the end of a career. For while great athletes come in all shapes and sizes, great gymnasts now come in one size only, small. Gymnasts are not the only athletes to place what can become a deadly premium on staying thin. Divers, swimmers, and skaters are all under constant and extreme pressure to keep their weight below normal levels. Skaters' eating habits, a lot of them are really screwed up because, you know, they, they'll end up starving themselves all day because they have to lose that extra two pounds to look great in their skating outfit for, for the competition in, in one week. Don Peters is the head coach of the U.S. women's gymnastic team. To help his gymnasts maintain control over their eating habits and their lives, for the past four years, he and other members of the U.S. Gymnastic Federation have been conducting nutrition education classes designed to educate not only gymnasts, but their parents and other coaches as well. Peters himself learned about eating disorders the hard way, having coached a number of sufferers, including Lucy Collins. Eating disorders are life-threatening and career-threatening. And if you're contributing to a child developing that kind of problem, uh, then, you know, that's, a, that's a form of child abuse. Obviously, most coaches and parents don't condone this type of behaviors, but we do need to be aware of the warning signs. And some of these are preoccupation with weight, a morbid fear of becoming fat, low self-esteem, hypersensitivity, and mood swings. And Donna, it seems the very thing that makes great at women athletes could predispose them to this type of disorder. Right, and it's a secretive uh, behavior they have, so it's very hard for parents and coaches to detect it. And you know this intimately because you had the courage to come out and admit that you had it, risking the support of your peer group, which you'd worked ho so hard to gain. But all of us that have been involved in the elite pressure cooker of sport feel an obligation to look at the pitfalls and talk about creative solutions. So if you have a daughter interested in sports, great. But make sure she understands that how she performs and what level she performs on does not define her identity or her self-worth. Make sure that she's involved in the creative aspect of her training, goal setting and setting limits. The process of making herself better is the point, not winning or losing. If she's not involved in this process, we've found by study that most likely she will be susceptible to an eating disorder. She may have a difficult time understanding who she is outside of her sport and will it be extremely susceptible to manipulation by others. Her validity as a person is not a question of what she wins, but who she is. Now back to you, Al. Okay, Donna, we will resume our coverage, our live coverage from the Salt Palace of the Olympic Trials in Women's Gymnastics on ABC's Wide World of Sports in a moment.
you're looking at Rhonda Fain, another member of the uh, Caroli gymnastic group here. She was seventh after the second rotation, but after the fine performance by Christy Phillips already on the balance beam, she is now pressured to record a 9.25 to move in front of Phillips for seventh place again. And here's what she did on the balance beam just moments ago. And Kathy, she is not what you would consider to be the picture of a gymnast. She is larger, a little bit more muscular, and for her age, just bigger than the other ones. And she's probably one of the most strong gymnast in the entire competition. She does have a lot more body to move around, but she does it very well. She moved to work with Bella three years ago, but her family remained in Coon Rapids, Minnesota. She says she doesn't miss all the other things that she's experienced in her life or has not experienced in her life, like dating and video games and Michael Jackson and who knows what, because she's never done them. Gymnastics is her entire life. She has always been a focused gymnast, and this is the event that she needed to be most focused on. You can see the concentration. She does her aerial walkover. Actually, that move was done about 15 years ago, but it still is difficult. Whoops, slight lack of flexibility on that split jump. And as many of the other gymnasts takes a slight breath before her dismount, double pike, and she's relieved that that's over with. That was then, and this is now. The judges rewarded her with a score of 9.588. Okay. She does so reclaim seventh best, place to go back in front best. of Christy Phillips. And so this battle to see if anyone can catch Melissa Marlowe still okay. continues. But okay. Marlowe okay. continues to remain right. strong. Good. Good. We're going to switch now to the story of Hope Spivey from the Parkett School in Allentown, Pennsylvania, who have been so helpful to us. And videotaping some of the instructional pieces that we've been able to show you today. She, like all the gymnasts, has felt many pressures, sometimes even thought of quitting. We asked her what that time was like in her career. Well, um, I did think about quitting, and I knew that I couldn't do that. And the reason why that I thought about quitting is because gymnastics wasn't going very well at the time, and I couldn't, like, get myself going. But um, then... After talking to my dad, who helps me a lot, um, he said, you know, it, it'd be kind of dumb. It, it would be wasteful because you're very talented and you don't need to quit. I mean, you have everything going for you. Just get your head screwed on. <laughs> now, live, Hope Spivey mounts the balance beam. She already on the uneven bars has a 9725, a 9825 on the vault. And in the compulsories on balance, she had a 975. So she's been very consistent and right in the middle of this race. It's would really take a major collapse for her to lose her standing right now, and there's a major break. Well, this has been her nemesis, uh, the balance beam. She has had her nerves under control for the most part, but if any event you would predict her to have a break, it would be on the balance beam. Kathy, how would that affect her score? Well, she it will cost her five-tenths of a point. And right now, her job is to just maintain control throughout the rest of the routine, which is hard to do when you've had a big break third place after the second rotation oh slight break there too she already has about seven tenths of a point in deduction amazing don't you think that someone could even think about quitting and then put in the effort good enough to at least be at the level where you can make the Olympic team? I think everybody thinks of it every now and then because of the pressure, but when it comes right down to making that decision, most don't quit. Our step at the end, that'll cost her another 10. And this could be a critical score for Hope Spivey, coached by Bill and Donna Strauss of the Parquettes in Pennsylvania. Once again, that balance beam is only four inches wide. Any slight movement to the right or left, just slightly off, even an inch, can cost you. You can see that her hips and shoulders look right in the middle of the beam, but just got off at the very end there. Her hips went slightly to the right. Her 
dismount obviously is a secure one. She has to fit both feet on that four inch apparatus. And the judges will not take off for that leg separation. And these are the most anxious of moments for the gymnasts like Hope Spivey. They've made an error. They just don't know how bad it is and just how badly it has hurt their chances to make the Olympic team. We'll find out. A score of 9.188 is bad news to Hope Spivey, but it could have been worse. It still is good enough to allow her to maintain her third place standing right now as the top six. Remember, I say it throughout the afternoon. They are the ones who will get a chance to go to Seoul and represent the United States. We're going to take a moment to focus on a situation that has really crowded the women's gymnastics scene for four years. In 84, Don Peters was the Olympic coach, and Bella Caroli, you remember him, reaching over the wall to to hug Mary Lou Retton. Well, Bell is still here, and so is Don, and they have not been able to resolve their differences. They have different philosophies about coaching. But this is only one of the situations that involves the USGF that we really think deserves a closer look. Bella Caroli, Don Peters, and much, much more as far as gymnastics is concerned. Right now, we are facing a, uh, a chaos. I uh, feel it. I read it. I wonder. I am embarrassed. And... Uh, and I don't believe that's right. Opposing views and dispute. Bella Caroli is involved in only one of the USGF's problems right now. He was the coach of Nadia and Mary Lou and of others who will play a large part of this year's Olympic team. His wife is an Olympic assistant, and he is not. The head man there is Don Peters, the 84 Olympic coach, a qualified man who was elected to the post using the current USGF system and one of many who disagree with the way Caroli operates his big money gymnast factory. Yet Bella was the most successful coach available based on individual results. Yet his declarations that he will not go to Seoul have created tension. I think that the controversy has been pushed because someone wants to push it. And I think that they should stop pushing and get on the, get behind the team and let's get this thing going. Is that someone Bella? Yeah. I know probably the most. And the, I'm the most entitled person to push those little buttons, but nobody knows where, where, when, and how manner, in which manner you have to push. If I would go over there, and I face, you know, the opposition, and that very, very, very against and very, very aggressive feeling of the coaching staff who right now is uh, in charge with the leadership of the team, I believe I would more hurt them than help them. USGF Executive Director Mike Jackie had proposed to the selection committee with no result, a system that would have rewarded Bella's and other coaches' success rates. He hopes to reach a compromise after the trials, but that may be the least of his problems. The LA Times has reported that the U.S. Justice Department is reviewing documents it received from four or five disgruntled members of the gymnastic community, allegedly detailing a variety of financial misdealings inside the USGF which has tax-free status and says it is aware of accounting problems and is trying to computerize its system to correct them while denying other charges. Meanwhile, the tug of war and review continues. And while it is not hard to believe that the ones hurt most are the ones who sacrifice the most for gymnastics. They can say that they're not a part of it and they're trying to stay uh, out of it and not be involved and not be affected. But when the people that they depend on uh, create so much controversy surrounding the team and their efforts. Uh, it does affect their performance. The USGF is not the only amateur federation in this country with problems. They're based with good, hard-working people whose good intentions sometimes go off course. Now, the man who gave Bella Caroli the delegation leader status, the honorary member, the figurehead role, if you will, that he turned down and said then and he wouldn't go to Seoul is Mike Jackie, the executive director of the USGF. And he now joins Frank Gifford. Frank? Thank you, Alan. Mike is, has joined me here in our host booth. And Mike, uh, you have a rather large forum. Uh, your response to the allegations, uh, the well-publicized allegations of the mishandling of the funds. Let's start there. Well, first of all, Frank, uh, I think it's important to say that those monies are non-taxable. They're generated in local areas, in regional areas, and they're kept in those areas. They are grassroots monies that come from cakewalks and sales and bake sales and entry fees for local meats. None of the money comes to the Federation office. We'd like to report that money because it falls on the good side of our non-for-profit. But at the end of any small gymnastics meet that, take, that may take place, there's a few dollars left over. It's used in the local area to support continuing gymnastics programs. It's really difficult to account for those monies. Our big eight accounting firm is
has told us they don't know if it should be our responsibility or the state's responsibility. We're aware of it. We've been looking into it for a couple years, and we'll continue to look into it and decide what's best. I don't want to raise any paranoia, but most federations are in the same boat. How come you? Well, I think uh, maybe we're in the limelight right now, but I think not only most gymnastics, or not only sports federations, I think all volunteer-based organizations in the country are probably in a very similar situation. Of course, the big thing uh, is going to be resolving the coaching situation you have. There's no question there is a tremendous rip between Don Peters and Bella Caroli. Uh, we are just a few weeks from the start of the Olympics. What do you plan to do? How do you plan to resolve this? Well, I think that you've got to look at Bella and Don as, as two very intense and very competitive individuals. Uh, all of the elite coaches are that way. I think when the chalk dust clears at the end of the competition and we have finally identified the six athletes, I think our Olympic coaching staff and the personal coaches of those six athletes will be able to get together and they will be able to decide what will be the very, very best way that we can prepare those six kids. At that point in time, everything has to be pushed to the side and there's only one consideration, that's preparation. Well, Mike, I mean, Bella Corolla could come in there with four or five of his own athletes. Wouldn't he would be better advised or wouldn't our federation be better served or the team better served if he were the head coach? And is that possible? Well, it's. I don't know if it's possible and I don't think that's the important thing, whether or not he's head coach. I think most importantly is that we give those athletes the preparation they deserve and it means that Bella Caroli needs to be intimately involved, then he should be in, intimately involved he's, in this federation's position to make sure that happens. He says he will not go to Seoul unless there is a change. You say he's going to be there, and we have a hard time resolving this. We will make sure it's resolved. It's in the sportsman's interest, the United States' best interest, and most importantly, the four or five or however many kids that Bella puts on the team, it's in their best interest. We can't let anything else sacrifice the performance of those athletes. Do you have a time and a place, perhaps even a date, or in the near future, that you plan to get the two coaches together and I make a decision? The, I think in the immediate future, as soon as the event's over and we know those athletes, we will address it directly and immediately. Okay. Any chance of Tim Dyke going as an honorary coach? We'd sure like to have that happen, and we'll see what we can do. Thank you, Mike. Thank you for joining us. Mike Jackie, the executive director of the United States Gymnastics Federation. And we'll be back in Salt Lake in just a moment. According to USGF Executive Director Mike Jackie, Bella just may go to Korea. Now here are the standings after three rotations. There's one to go. The top five positions are fairly firm. After that, it's pretty close. Melissa Marlowe, Rhonda Fain, Christy Phillips. She's in eighth place. Henrik and Dundas really do not have much of a chance in catching the group. This is then the final chance in the final routine, in the final rotation for Christy Phillips at these Olympic trials. Eighth after the third rotation, she really can't afford a hundredth or even a tenth off. As she said in the beginning, she has to do the routine of her life because Rhonda and Melissa both have exceptional routines if they hit. And they're coming up right after her. This is the move that could give her trouble. Let's see if she hits it. She does. This is where Christy's personality shines. Kind of slow movements are strategically planned so the gymnast gets a little bit of a breath before they have to do their second tumbling run and watch this one she prepares in this corner it's a double run actually punch front and she continues Nadia's routine one time. And this is where it counts, this last tumbling run, the last move of her routine and of the competition. Not quite the difficulty that she's usually up to. She stepped out. She and stepped the, out, the yellow flag is up, her foot went out of bounds. And that could mean a tenth of a point. All oh, right. That was a good one. Good one. I think Bella knows. He usually has a big hug if there's a 10 or a 9.95. You can almost judge the score that he expects to receive from the strength of the hug. Here's where she went out of bounds on the dismount. And obviously that tenth of point, you just can't give it up when the competition is this close. 
but you're pushing so hard. Double twist there. You can see her heels are slightly over. Her coach, Marta Caroli, there said that she was going to play it safe at the end, and yet it cost her a tenth of a point. Christy may have needed just a little bit more time to get her body back to the strength she needs to perform with all the weight she had to lose. And there you see right along that white line, that's out of bounds. Christy Phillips, you don't know what's going to happen in the routines that follow, but just maybe she may have missed this Olympic team by two inches. Now, Melissa Marlowe is getting set to perform on her last rotation performance. It will be on the balance beam. She is sixth after the third rotation. Remember, sixth is the cutoff. Seventh place is an alternate in Seoul. Eighth place is an alternate that remains back in the United States. And she's very focused. This has also been an event for Melissa that has given her trouble in the past. Now, something she may be thinking about is her performance at the USA Championships. She fell off the balance beam there and wound up 11th in the all-around. Here at the trial, she has made up five spots to where she sits now at sixth. Very difficult combination leap there. Slight bobble. Another tough leap. There's another tenth or two. Now, that should have been a round off to immediate split jump, but she's playing it a little cautious here. Christy Phillips score a 9.6, and she's watching deep in her heart, maybe hoping that Melissa Marlowe has a few more of those mistakes in her. concentration so far getting prepared for a big tumbling move one of the requirements her dismount double pike she may have just done it she only needs a 9.1 to move in front of Phillips and I think she's got that to tell and especially after watching what happened to Dan Hayden last night whether it's cemented until it's over but it looks right now as though Missy Marlowe will be one of those representing the United States of America but remember still to come yet another one of the Caroli gymnasts her name is Rhonda Fain Live in Salt Lake City, Al Troutwig along with Kathy Rigby McCoy. Becky Dixon is here as well as Donna DeVarona and Frank Gifford is still upstairs in the host position as we continue on ABC's Wide World of Sports. You're looking at the last woman, we believe, who has a realistic hope of challenging for any of the spots left of honor here at the Olympic Trials. Rhonda Fain. And she has to fight that sinking feeling that one feels when the competitor before you has done a magnificent job and you're so close. Now, catching Missy Marlowe is nearly impossible for Rhonda. She needs a 9.6, though, to move in front of her teammate, Chrissy Phillips, into seventh place. Now, that's the alternate position. With gymnastics the way it is, anything could happen. And while nobody wishes injury on anybody, um, you have to be just as prepared in that seventh position. Now, having punched out the calculator as quickly as we can, it is impossible for Rhonda Fain to catch Missy Marlowe. And if that's the case, Missy Marlowe is going to go to Seoul. She doesn't look too disappointed here on the floor, X, though. She's giving it her all. A 
lot of credit to her for her performance at the World Championships. She is a tough, tough competitor, and I think we'll see more of her. One of the reasons why it is so difficult for the gymnasts to make up the tenths and hundredths needed is that in this last stage in the optionals, there is a multiplication factor. You don't get to keep your entire score, and so the, the actual score that you receive is, is downgraded, and the numbers that you receive aren't what they appear, and so the numbers that you can make up really come slower than they might appear to you. It is a complicated mathematical procedure which will determine who goes, and right now we think we have a pretty good idea. Rhonda Payne's score will be coming up in a moment. Back in Salt Lake City, you're looking at Shelly Stack, fifth after the third rotation on the balance beam. Now we're at the point where cautious optimism is the rule. Last night we were at the same, the same point where we thought the Olympic team was decided, and then suddenly Dan Hayden's two falls from the, the cold steel of the high bar. Shelly Stack has her position locked. If only she does not make a major mistake. And Al, so far she's not made a mistake. She doesn't quite have the polish that her teammates uh, have as far as her dancing abilities, but she certainly has a difficulty in tumbling. Slight bend of the knees there. Rhonda Fain has a 9-6-7-5 that moves her in front of Christy Phillips into seventh place. Although you see little wobbles in her ankle, she's moving quite well. She's not holding back. She doesn't seem to be too cautious. But those bent knees are going to hurt her. Right now it looks as though Bella Caroli will send three gymnasts on the main team and have both the backup alternates to the U.S. Olympic team. And her dismount, double pike, little hop there. She had about three or four tenths of a point in bobbles and little mistakes. To balance that statement I just made, to be fair, really, due in large part to bad luck, Don Peters will have no gymnasts on the U.S. Olympic team. I think Shelley's was good enough to do exactly what she needed the score to do for her. And that, I think, is a credit to Bella in the way he teaches these athletes to concentrate and to be so focused, and once again, to practice so many repetitions. Her family moved, moved to Houston from Endicott, New York, and her father wound up eventually losing his job, and there were some difficult times for the Stack family, but uh, I don't think they're on their mind right now. And as you can see, almost there's almost a relief as you get to this point in your routine. You, uh, once again, you can't give up, you can't stop concentrating, but you know it's the end, and you're off that four-inch piece app apparatus, and you can relax. And we are waiting for the score for Shelly Stack, 15 years old, 74 pounds. Just a year ago, she was competing on the junior level and was second in the all-around. And we're seeing some mid-range numbers there. That's the score from Judge 4, not her final score. There are six judges. They throw out the high and the low and average the middle four. And The score for Shelly Stack is a 9.575. And I don't think that will do her any damage. It will keep her position, I believe. And even if it had changed her position the slightest bit, she really had plenty of room uh, on Melissa Marlowe. You don't have to win this thing. You just need to finish in the top six. Now, here's Hope Spivey. She is in the identical position as Shelly Stack was. Spivey just needs to get through the routine cleanly. But remember, the last time we checked in on Spivey, she had a rocky time on the balance beam. She really has great power, and her music is to Cats, the Broadway musical Cats. In the compulsories, Kathy, this was her best event. 9-9 nine, nine was her score in floor exercise. Although you can never get too complacent about any of the events because of the difficulty levels, this is a very good event for her. She begins with a double layout, one of the toughest moves in the competition. Body going around two times in a laid out position. Whoops, almost broke it there, but that will only be two tenths and the judges will take into consideration the difficulty level. No 
problem there. some of the greatest difficulty in this exercise, as you will see at the end of her routine. She ends with what most gymnasts open with, and that is a full-in double back. Let's see if she throws it. Oh, another slight break. There's about four tenths of a point in deductions there. Very expressive face. 17-year-old Hope Spivey. Originally from Suffolk, Virginia, now she's a senior at Allentown Central Catholic High. Okay. It was a slightly flawed routine. Well, we always talk about endurance on this last tumbling run, and you really need it. It's like running the 440. You have to go all out, and when you've been under this much, much pressure for so long, sometimes that catches up with you. There's Donna Strauss, her coach. A 9.20 will move her in front of Stack and onto the team. We'll see whether she gets it in a moment. Hope Spivey has made the U.S. Olympic team. Some very emotional hugs between her and her coach, Bill Strauss, and Donna Strauss. Her score is a 9.663. Now, the routine still to come for the other gymnasts who simply must also get through to cleanly make the team include Brandy Johnson, Phoebe Mills, and Kelly Garrison Steves. Phoebe Mills was first after the third rotation. As a matter of fact, she has been first for quite some time as far as U.S. gymnastics are concerned. She comes from a background of many athletes, a background of athletic dedication, to be sure. I'm totally dedicated to my sport because it's what I love doing, and I'm disciplined because this I'll do anything that I have to do in order to achieve my goal. Fifteen-year-old Phoebe Mills has a dream of one day being an Olympic champion. It's the dream that motivated her to move from Northfield, Illinois, to Houston, Texas, four years ago when she was only 11. Now she spends seven hours a day, six days a week, training. It's the only life she wants and knows. You have to fight for it. You want to do everything extra possible in order to make it to the Olympics and to be at your best there. My mom moved down about a year and a half ago, and that was really good for me because I'd been away from home for so long, and I was beginning to miss my family and my mom more and more, and so I really needed somebody down here that would be there, you know, to love me and stuff like that. Church right there. No. I can't really lay off any time because I have such little time until the Olympics, and I always need to be working out. Go, 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 let's go. He's just a uh, young athlete with a tremendous dedication and desire. She does not want to impress through her personal appearance. She wants to impress through her performances. And that's very important. And well, it was a pretty big decision whether I should stay in school or not. I tried to stay in it for as long as possible, and I was in it last year. I really had to focus myself on my gymnastics if I want to do well. And so school was kind of just a nuisance at that time the thing that keeps me going is the olympics if it ever gets hard i think of all that i've done so far and what i want to get to and all that i've sacrificed and it'd be like a total waste if i just gave it all up well, Kathy, I know the standings reveal her status right now, but is she the best one in America right now? She is the best, she, and she has 90% determination and, and the rest talent, but uh, she is our biggest hope, I think, for a medal. In a moment, it will be Phoebe Mills' chance and the last rotation here in Salt Lake City as Coca-Cola presents the U.S. Olympic trials, and we'll have more after this message and a word from our local stations.
We continue our live coverage on ABC's Wide World of Sports this afternoon as the determination as to who will represent the United States in the sport of women's gymnastics will be made today here at the Salt Palace in Salt Lake City. The final rotation now for Kelly, Garris, and Steves. At the age of 21, no doubt a leadership role will be hers if she's able to get through this routine and, and make the team. Just as Kathy Johnson was the leader of the women's gymnastic team in 1984. So rare, really, Kathy, not to see a, a gymnast from a, a club like the Parquettes or Don Peters' Scats or Carolis. Uh, she is obviously from the University of Oklahoma and has survived through the collegiate performances as well. Well, the reason I think she's had the longevity is she's been able to put her career in gymnastics and her personal life in perspective. Kelly, since 14, has taken an active part in the decision-making process. Triple Whoops. twist there. Step out. That's going to cost her a couple tests, but a very difficult move. But she has been involved in the decision-making process concerning her training, and her coach says it's really helped her confidence and allowed her to foster creativity in the sport and just maintain her interest. She has a fairly large margin of error. A very strong second place standing right now for Kelly Garrison Steves. It's so important to not let go of that concentration, which is easy to do on the last event, especially if it's the floor exercise. That's oh, twice boy. now. Two times. And two major breaks comes down to the last event. She only needs an 8.7 to hold second place. But now obviously not too happy with what just happened on the floor exercise. Here's well, mistake number one. It could be caused of a last lack of concentration or just fatigue from all the pressures. Triple twist, it's so difficult to stop that particular move. You're twisting so fast, and knowing when to come out is tough. Here's mistake number two. She looked like she had a great deal of speed. Let's see what happens in the air. She just held on to it a little bit too long. She over-rotated. And now you're just not quite sure what's going to pop up. 1984 at the U.S. Olympic Trials, guess what? She fell twice and didn't make the team. Now, Brandy Johnson was one of the leaders after the third rotation, and she's getting ready to go. Well, that's Bill Strauss, who is from the Parquettes, not even, not even Brandy's coach. But this gymnastic community is filled with friendships, special friendships that have developed with traveling all over the world over the years and spending as much time as they do on the road in hotels and in arenas. I do believe the coaches will get together when it comes down to training time and getting prepared for Seoul. Here's another Caroli gymnast, Brandy Johnson. She's had a little bit of a rough day, Kathy, but she still is, is right there in fourth place after the third. And she needs a 9.30 to just hold her position. Once again, this is a precarious event, but I think that Brandy can hold on to it. Talking to Marta Caroli, her coach, as well as Bella, she feels that Brandy is very confident on this apparatus. Kelly Garrison Steve's got a 9.463. She is safe and can pack her bags. Critical move coming up here. Front flip, and boy, she nails that. Get your visa, Kelly. Obviously, the music is not to the balance beam, although she's right in time with it. to reckon with. Brandy Johnson hugs Bella. Bella hugs Brandy. She's one of three Caroli gymnasts we think are on their way to the Summer Olympics.
Bella Caroli thinks Brandy Johnson has that special explosive something that could make her something extra special. And we're waiting for her score on the balance beam. Meanwhile, sitting next to Shelly Stack, who is on the U.S. Olympic team, unofficially, of course, is Chrissy Phillips. And we, we know that Chrissy will not be going. Here now is Phoebe Mills. The score for Brandy Johnson was a 9.75. She will remain in fourth. And she will be going with Shelly Stack and with Melissa Marlowe and with Kelly Garrison Steves and with Hope Spivey. And there's no doubt that Phoebe Mills. If Phoebe can perform like she has performed in these trials so far at the Olympics, you can most definitely see the possibility of a medal. She has tremendous form. Her difficulty is there, and she moves with such confidence. Kathy, she's really been nearly perfect. 9938, 99 on the uneven bars, floor exercise, 9963. She had a slight bobble there, but did you see how she covered it up? The judges will take less off for that. difficult to do. And her dismount. Double tuck. Great competition for Phoebe. There's the mother of Phoebe Mills. Yet another one of the fine athletes to come out of the family. Really easily predict a team medal. But they don't, and it's nearly impossible to predict that right now. But no doubt for this team. Now, but on individual events, it's a totally different story. On any given day, someone like Phoebe certainly has the talent to go up against the the other top gymnasts in the world. There's Mary Lou Retton. Dixon. Al, this is certainly a wonderful moment for the Mills family. There's been a lot of hugging and kissing up here. Susan, your family is so supportive of each other. Do you, each of you feel like you've had a part in Phoebe's wonderful success? We all have a part in everyone's successes. Your family is spread out now over three states, training for various sports, but you seem to maintain a very strong family bond. How do you do that, Chris? On the telephone. <laughs> I bet you have a big bill. By, uh, by being very loving and caring, basically. Will you be going to Seoul? Working on it. Yeah, I guess so. If we can we figure out a way a place to get there. To stay. If anyone has places to stay. We're a little superstitious, so we don't count our chickens till they're hatched. I guess they've hatched now. <laughs> they have hatched. Have a wonderful Except trip. We hope you make it. Al, back to you. <laughs> okay, Becky. Thank you very much. Phoebe Mills score a 9.850. And watching on television, I guess we have to assume from that conversation is the rest of the Mills family, wherever they may be, training for whatever they have in mind somewhere around this country. Still to come, the official presentation of the United States Olympic team in women's gymnastics for 1988. And we'll have that in a moment as we continue live on ABC. What had to be the greatest day of her life will be far from that for Christy Phillips. She was just not able to be good enough today to become a member of the U.S. Olympic team. Battling so hard to lose the weight that came with the, the changing of her body as she just happened to grow older and become a woman, Christy just needed a little bit more time. And unfortunately, the Olympic schedule just wasn't able to do that for her. Then the standings are these unofficially. The top six member will go. The seventh member of this team will be an alternate. The eighth member will be another alternate remaining back in the United States. The average age of this team, 16.5 years. Of, the biggest difference from this team to the 1984 team is that that 84 team had three members of the 1980 team on it. This team has no members from the 1984 squad. Mills, Spivey, Johnson, and Stack did not compete in Rotterdam at the 87 World Championships. 
And of course, Do Yamashiro remembers the sixth place finish of the United States at those world championships. But her sprained ankle received nine days ago was just not strong enough to even allow her to have the chance to compete. Her dream was dashed without even a chance. As was her friend and teammate Sabrina Marr, who was unable to go beyond the compulsories. Now, underneath the, the area there where you saw Christy Phillips, who just walked away from it all, there are some very nervous, happy women. Not the least of which is Donna Deverona. Don Peters is out on the floor as we'll get set to join uh, Donna Deverona and Becky Dixon over in just a minute. Now, Don, this has been a very interesting day for you, uh, watching the team evolve without your own members out there. I know that had to be difficult for you. Yeah, we had some, a lot of bad luck going into this competition with Sabrina Marr and uh, Do Yamashiro with some physical injuries. And uh, that was kind of tough for them and, and for me to take. But uh, as the competition went on, uh, I can tell you the team that we're fielding is going to be, they are the best team we have right now, and they're going to be a very good team. Don, how do you handle that, your own personal feelings? You've dedicated as much time as anyone as to putting your gymnasts out there to give them at least the chance to compete, and then suddenly, you know, for whatever reason, uh, the body fails on them. Well, I mean, that's that happens in all sports, and, uh, you know, it's, a, it's very difficult to watch a young kid that works hard for four years, like... Uh, Doe and Sabrina have and, and come over overcome so many adversities and then to come out and get to the last meet like this and then have it go bad it's it's really tough but again that's that's a that's part of sports. Don I hope this isn't a surprise for you but earlier on our telecast Mike Jackie said that now that the team is all set and done he wants to get all the interested parties involved including Bella yourself and the Strausses and hopefully work out a compromise so that everyone can work together and get everybody involved and in his words I believe try to get Bella to go to Seoul and help the team. Can that happen? Do you want that? You want to see that happen? Well I hope so. I, I mean I I've said all along the thing that we need to do to make this thing work is to is for everyone to cooperate in, in, a, in a team joint effort and that's what the that's what the Olympics is all about, and that's what the United States is all about, and, and our team. So I, I think that's going to happen. I'm optimistic that, that everybody will get it together. All right, Don, I'm glad to hear that. Thank you very much, and good luck in Seoul. Thank Don you. Don Peters, the 1984 Olympic coach. There is Bella Caroli, and standing right near Bella is Donna Deverona. Donna? Actually, um, Al, I'm with Mike Jackie at this point, and uh, I just heard that Don Peters had said he hopes he'd work something out to make sure that Bella goes. If he does go, is there any idea uh, if he'll be able to get on the floor? Because that's what he was protesting before, that he needed to be with his athletes. Well, that's something we'll have to determine, Don. And I think a lot of it will depend on uh, the credentialing situation. You know, we're only allowed two coaches on the floor. We always have one male and one female. But uh, I think as soon as we're done, which is we got the athletes now, and uh, we're going to get the personal coaches, we're going to get the Olympic coaching staff together. It's uh, our plan that we will make sure that the athletes have every bit of support that they need. Uh, we're going to make sure that Bella gets what he needs because he needs to prepare his kids just like uh, the Strausses need to prepare theirs and uh, Mark Lee with Missy and uh, uh, Becky Buick with uh, Kelly. So uh, we're going to do that. That's our job. That's what we're going to get done. We're going to have a great team in Seoul. So you're really telling me that you figured it out and he's going to be on the floor? What? I didn't say he's going to be on the floor. We're going to make sure he coaches his athletes. Okay. The, the other part of it, that's something that we'll just have to wait and see if we can work that out or not. Okay. Back to you, Al. All right, Donna, now the crowd, which in large part has remained in their seats, they want to meet the team officially. And that's about to happen here at the Salt Palace. Kathy, Mike Jackie said we're going to have a great team. Is that possible? I think that we can have a very good team, especially if all the coaches get together. But one of the things I think that we are going to need to do that in some of the other teams that we've had in the Olympics that we haven't done is we have a tendency to break on some of the apparatus at inopportune times. We need them to be strong mentally. We need to go them to go into the performance without their tail between their legs and really fighting and knowing that they are a good team. A year ago at the World Championships, there were many, many mistakes as the United States on the women's side finished in sixth place. But this is a better team with some stronger members. Phoebe Mills is much better than she was a year ago. So is Brandy Johnson, so is Shelly Stack, and Melissa Marlowe is peaking at just the right moment. And also out there with that group is Rhonda Fain, who will be the alternate for this team, heading to Seoul. And the last two members of the delegation, Don Peters and his assistant coach, Marta Caroli, Bella's wife. There's a tremendous amount of talent out there.
Let's go to Becky Dixon, who's with Bella Caroli. Bella, Don Peters and Mike Jackie have both just said that they hope that everyone can work things out and that you will be going to Seoul. What will it take to get Bella Caroli to Seoul? First of all, I have to know what I'm going there, <laughs> why I'm there. Uh, should I want to go as spectator and uh, should I want to go as visitor to Seoul, Korea? Uh, if I'm going to coach, if I'm going to be there to represent the best interest of the kids, yes, I'll be there. So Otherwise you're saying not. you will go if you can be the coach on the floor? Exclusively. Bella, this is a wonderful day for you. Three yeah. gymnasts on the team and one alternate. Right. What is it about that Caroli team that they have just stood out here? Well, the kids just prepared. They were prepared for this one. I felt the obligation. They feel the obligation to represent the country right, powerful, into a good athletic manner. And I believe they showed that. Bella, you talked about obligation. Do you feel like you have an obligation to go to Seoul to be with your gymnasts? You have four of them going. Certainly, I do have uh, the feeling. I do have the obligation. I feel it. And I uh, assume it. And I would do it if the people would give me the opportunity to, to exercise it. All right, Bella, thank you, and congratulations today. Al. All right, Becky, it should be pointed out that last night in the men's competition, the University of Nebraska had five members of the team that will be going to Seoul, five of the seven. And no one screamed out for Francis Allen to be the coach of the U.S. Olympic team. He's the coach at Nebraska. That job will go to A.B. Grossfeld. But this is a much different situation. Bella's such a large media celebrity, and that's tough for Don to battle because that's his biggest flaw. At least it seems that here. Well, you know, one of the other things that I wanted to mention is that these athletes are much younger than the men who are competing. They're much more able to compete on their own. When you're this young and you're so dependent on your coach to motivate you, it's nice to have your coach there with you. The ceremony continuing out on the mat. Also out there is Kenny Rogers. Of course, you know Kenny. He has recorded a song in praise of the gymnasts. Bob Spivey getting introduced to the crowd. It's Kenny Rogers right there in the beard. Hope Spivey said she never thought she could get this far. Three years ago, she was a class two competitor. Here's another look at the women's gymnastics team for the Olympics in Seoul in September that was determined today. What began four years ago is the mission for Seoul for hundreds of gymnasts from Baton Rouge, Chicago, Salt Lake, Allentown, Los Angeles, and the rest of America is now down to the dreams of six young women. Others who practice their routines just as many times or perhaps had their bodies fail them as we saw today, missed by tenths or hundreds of points awarded by judges most of them have never met. Having survived these trials, and they are trials, these six now head to a place they do not know to face other young women they know too well. Like Daniela Silivac of the world champion Romanians, whose smooth refinement can be unbeatable. Or Elena Shushinova of the Soviet Union. Whose explosiveness is matched only by the level of inner strength reflected in her stern poker face. The chances of beating them are small, very small for the U.S., but all the American Six wanted to earn was a chance. The same type of chance that Max Schmeling gave to Joe Lewis. The same type of chance Dave Waddell had in 1972 and that the U.S. hockey team had in 1980. They now have that chance, and that's all they ever wanted. Frank Gifford. Earlier, Ben Johnson in the Canadian Olympic Trials. And a 9.90, we gave it to you unofficial. It is official. Seven one hundredths of a second off his world record at 9.83. Tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern.